Good evening and welcome to Africa News Network First Fast Live. My name is Cindy Mabi and you're watching ANN7 Prime. The anti-sexual harassment social media campaign, hashtag MeToo, is recognized as the person of the year by Times Magazine. The magazine's cover features Ashley Jada Taylor Swift and others <laughs> who, who had broken their silence around the sexual harassment. Numerous women have spoken out since October about sexual misconduct by dozens of high-profile men in entertainment, media, business and sport. Former ANC MP and musician Jennifer Ferguson also came out to level rape allegations against Safa Barsa Denny Jordan. She accused him of raping her 24 years ago but has, uh, has, pressed, uh, has not pressed formal charges. And the big question is whether the hashtag movement can stop women abuse. Let's take a look at the so-called silence breakers revolution. The hashtag MeToo tweets on sexual harassment collectively named as the silence breakers and MeToo recognizes as cultural crusaders by Times Magazine. The social media movement fueled worldwide debates about sexual abuse and assault. The hashtag MeToo recognized as the fastest moving social change agent in decades. And the movement is started by courageous women who share their experiences of sexual violence. Times Persons of the Year is Silence Breakers, the Silence Breakers, um, and those are the group of women who all stepped forward this year to name uh, their sexual harassers, to accuse uh, people of abuse in the workplace, um, and that goes across all industries, from Hollywood and media to you know, the agricultural fields and uh, housekeepers who are speaking out at hotels about the harassment that takes place in those areas too. And the impact of the hashtag MeToo campaign has reached all corners of the globe. And we we'll take a look at some facts regarding the movement. It's approximately 1.7 million hashtag MeToo tweets and retweets. People in 85 countries publish personal experiences supporting victims of sexual misconduct. And reports show that over 30% of men participated in the social movement. Facebook reported 12 million mentions of hashtag MeToo in 24 hours by 4.7 million users worldwide. And joining us in studio, Javu Baloi, Commission for Gender Equality Spokesperson, and uh, Shahida Omar, a Teddy Bear Clinic Clinical Director via Skype, Sia Bulela Gentile is an activist of uh, Not In My Name. And good evening to all our guests. Thanks so much for joining us. The lines are open 011-542-2186. The critical question of whether hashtags have the impact of uh, changing behavior around sexual misconduct. We'll start with you, Mr. Baloi. Um, thanks for having us, uh, uh, Cindy. What we have seen on hashtag MeToo, it has been phenom it's beyond imagination. We never thought people of high stature that, you know, normally uh, people assume that nothing happens unto them will come up to the fore and then um, um, allay their fears and break the silence, said, me too, I've been a victim of this. All they needed is somebody to listen to them all those years, but this has given them a platform to say, I am courageous enough, I can face my fears and stand my ground to say somebody has, has, has done this to me. And uh, people with, with, with big stature, that is encouraging for people who have been victims and survivors of, of the scourge which is, you know, is going on unabated at times in our country to come out to say, not only it's me, but someone whom I held in high regard, someone whom I thought is my role model, somebody who's a celebrity out there is coming out to say, I have been a victim of abuse, I've been a victim of sexual abuse and violence in my lifetime. Yeah, but besides the reputational damage to the implicated party, what else does the hashtag do? Or perhaps we should have a perpetrators hashtag me too where they confess their sins without having to wait so long um, thank you very much Cindy I think uh, it is important also to note that this hashtag what it does uh, especially to victims is that uh, some of them they find closure after coming out you know because there's fear there is that there has been um, in their lives so finally coming out and seeing other multitudes of people uh, rallying behind you and with you uh, so it's very important that we applaud whoever started the hashtag and also to say that this now is an opportunity for those in authority to actually take the the the, the fight from social media into actual uh, um, action whereby we uh, we, we, we talk about the justice system, uh, your SAPS in our case in South Africa. Uh, those cases need to be resurrected. If ever they were neglected, uh, perpetrators must face the full might of the law. So it's, it's, it's very important.
Mm, let's invite uh, Dr. Shahida Omar from the Teddy, Gle uh, Teddy Bear Clinic as, as the uh, clinical director. Dr. Omar, good evening to you and thanks so much for joining us. In, 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 the, uh, in light of justice being served, especially to perpetrators who have been named, the burden is still with the victim in terms of having to prove or even pursue the case. Uh, is there a, another way where we can circumvent this particular challenge? Well, I think firstly, the fact that the, there's been recognition and there's been acknowledgement certainly is a positive uh, direction for victims that have not come out in the open and breaking the silence is actually the only way to go. And what my two previous colleagues, esteemed colleagues, alluded to the fact that, uh, you know, there's people have actually come out in support of these victims. So this acknowledgement validation in itself is a very healing and therapeutic process by breaking the silence already uh, have, has made many victims realize that the stigma that has been attached to their pain, their trauma that has been invisible for many years is now finally being recognized that people are all coming out in full support. And the reality is that it's, it's not, uh, uh, you know, the, the reality is that it's the best of people who are responsible for this heinous crime. So I think this is the only route for victims to go, for people to come out and, and spell it out and shatter their silence. So, so this is... There's going to be an, uh, an uh, Dr. Omar, your line is breaking up a little bit, but, but you know, social media and its influence and, and power, if you will, sitting in a cyber realm is not a court of law. It cannot issue convictions. So the point is, how do we take it further beyond the condemnation of the alleged perpetrators? Yes, it has to be taken further where it has to be reported and due processes need to be followed. So these victims need to be given the support in following the legal processes by reporting the matter, by getting court preparation if a case is opened and, and to continue receiving therapy in, in that way. Certainly, uh, I think more uh, uh, action can be delivered or mobilized. Mm. Uh, Mr. Gentile, in hashtag not in my name, in what you've done uh, for victim support and ensuring that court cases are seen through, but we've also seen uh, a retraction of those particular charges, if you will, which counters the whole fight against women abuse. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's one of those, um, but as I usually say, that will not be dismayed and will not lose heart. Uh, but the work that we've done, in fact, not in my name, uh, you'll remember that it was founded on basis that this campaigns, these hashtags need to be sustainable uh, because we cannot have a, 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 a Me Too hashtag today, then three years down the line, it's, it's gone, where else we are still stuck with gender-based violence, femicide and rape culture in our society. So not in my name was formed as, as a response to that, that will have uh, uh, solutions that are sustainable. So um, I think this is what you should do also with uh, hashtag me too. I don't know who um, who's, who's the person or people that are, that are involved in South, in South Africa, but I would love to get in touch with them. Um, but the work that we are doing so far, it's, it's, it's very good and the response has been quite amazing. And yes, it will, uh, um, the retraction of cases will always be, be, be a form of a setback. But like any other revolution, there's, uh, uh, there's casualties. In, mm. in, in, in is the missing link the collaboration because all these efforts as noble as they are government agencies support uh, and uh, you know organizations like yourself that you're operating in silos there isn't a national vision or approach to dealing with with, with issues in of fact I, I, I like what you just said now because two weeks ago uh, we're in Cape Town I was just telling my colleague here um, they they were launching it was for men's parliament but after that they were launching another campaign uh, which is called uh, uh, No Excuse. I'm sure you might have seen about it. And I was having a conversation with, with a friend of, of mine, Matthew Booth, and he said the same thing. Uh, we're having all these little particles, you know, and, and it, will, it will make sense if all of us, we actually come together and, and form one uh, 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 big movement that will see the eradication of gender-based violence. But now, here's the, here's the catch thing, if I may state this quickly, is that... And I, I know I'm going to be uh, uh, foreseeing this, but gender-based violence is not a priority in South Africa. 
And I'm saying this because I've seen from experience that uh, in terms of resources and things like that, we are the last people on, on, on the bottom of the food chain. So, so we have these organizations and those that are able to get little resources, they use them alone without calling everyone else. So, so it, is, it is very important that we all join forces. I don't know who's going to facilitate that. Mm. And I mean, as a Chapter it. 9 institution, surely you mm. should have those exactly. kind of resources. Would you concur that, in fact, gender-based violence has become a subculture, we've become immune to it, and it's not prioritized? It's, you know what, it, we, it, funny enough, you know, we have been discussing with the Chepes and Lula Manare some of these issues, that, you know, we don't have a gender-responsive budgeting for entities that work in this field, yet we expected to do miracles. You know, at times, you know, we take cases that have been um, failing on the, on, the, on, the, on the system. We had the case in, the, in, in, in Hamas Kral, we worked with various people um, where a woman was shot to death and then the case, you know, took uh, seven years for justice. You, you see how ju uh, the, our justice system also delay the issues, gen gender-based cases, but wherever they want to, 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 to fast-track them, like in the Pistorius case, Panayoti, they do that. What we need to do with uh, hashtag in my name and other entities is to force government to have a strategy which deals with gender-based violence and then bring on faith-based institutions, bring in civil society, bring in all the traditional authorities and Chapter 9 institutions to see there so that we can have a vision for the country. Because also, we must also learn to have a, a accurate statistics on gender-based violence because what we do have now, it's not exactly what we think it could be the real statistics. So if we can do, do that, uh, Cindy, I'm telling you, after battle will be and more money pumped in entities like ourselves, like not in my name, and other institutions that work in this field. Mm. Even the women ministry have got little, little budget. Mm. Uh, Dr. Omar, on your, your experience in how these things can be better executed for a sustainable um, impact or effect uh, when it comes to gender-based violence, what, what is your, where are the gaps in your experience? So the gaps are very... Dr. Omar? Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you now. Okay, I said the gaps are very clear. If we look at law enforcement agencies at the reception level, at station level, where cases are reported and the way they yeah, are Dr. Omar, I think we, we're going to have to come back to you. Often the line is really... Yeah, the line is, is, is not very clear. But uh, Mr. Gentile, perhaps that, that question, and it's something that is in the public report, and I'm sure mm -hmm. that government has highlighted as well. Where are the um, instruments or mechanisms to mm -hmm. streamline issues around gender violence? Well, to be honest, uh, and I like what my colleague just said, that the women's ministry itself, because we are very working closely with them, um, they in fact have come out and said, we don't have money. Not even little resources, Mr. Valoy. They don't have money. That's what they said. And 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 for me, it's 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 unacceptable for the government to say that they have no money for such uh, uh, big things such as gender-based violence. Where else in they've got budget for all these other things? Some of them which not are, life, uh, are not life-threatening. They are not agent. But uh, 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 but statistically, in South Africa, we are one of the um, 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 most violent countries. Three days. Every, every day, three, three women at, at die um, at the hands of their intimate partner, which is femicide. So, so this should be on top of our priority list, in fact. The government must release the resources uh, instead of them and, and their friends uh, doing other things I won't mention here. Please, we really need to start uh, to prioritize gender-based violence, especially the organizations, faith-based, uh, NGOs, mm. everyone who's involved in this space. You, you've, to you've touched on statistics and uh, also aligning all of these other efforts, but we know, as a matter of fact, that uh, perpetrators by themselves, unless their mm. court will then have to face the law, as it were, but would not by their own accord come mm. out. And, you know, the statistics will show that a woman, before she even reaches ad 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 adolescence or even adulthood, would have had some form of, of sexual violence per um, perpetrated, perpetrated against her. So shouldn't we have a hashtag me too where the perpetrator is encouraged to come out? Yeah, we need to have systems like that. You know, there was an event where we were as a commission for gender equality. We had perpetrators talking, we had perpetrators confessing themselves and even telling us the mod, some of the modi operandas, how they do it. We're working with the women ministry, GCIS and other governments and even other st stakeholders. What needs to be done is that, you know, we need to embrace them, to talk to them and so that, you know, they can be the champion 
champions of this, some of this, uh, because they have been there, they have repented, and because, you know, the issue is that we shun them, saying because they've done something, society is difficult to, to take them back. But the issue, the main issue is that, you know, let us use them as ambassadors to say, look, I have done it, the consequences were dire. It's not nice, they're confessing, it's not nice to cite the president, because, you know, some of these cases, um, it's not because they are being withdrawn, Cindy, because of a secondary victimization, which the victim suffers at the hands of the police, when they go to court, it's as, it, it, as if those women who have been raped, they're the ones that were raped. Because, you know, the questioning and the insensitivity thereof needs to be looked at so that, you know, people won't withdraw cases. People will find the, 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 um, the police station as the most friendly environment for them to come and lay the pro so that they can even have a discussion among themselves, what is it that, you know, happened unto them. Mm. So that's, that's some of the things that we need to do. Okay, but how far widespread is that particular program in terms of the numbers versus the number of victims? How many other perp perpetrators have come forward, for example? There are many of them that are coming forward. Some of them, they want to come anonymously. Um, some of them, like I'm saying that, you know, those that, you know, we, there's a, there's a, there's a program that Songa Gender Justice won an award with a million guardian or on, that, you know, they're working with a victim, with a, with a prisoner in the, in the prison. Lots of them are coming out. They realize they can play a, a role in lending a hand. And we work with some of them that, you know, have come out um, at the Commission for Gender Equality in some of these men's forum. They do come out and start talking that, you know, I have been one of those people behind this, but this is what, you know, my regrets, this can be done in order to, for quick wins. We have, we have got low, I mean, yeah, if you just take, for example, uh, uh, sorry to break your word, uh, Patrick Shai, he's now become that poster boy, if you will, mm. of uh, what it means to repent and to uh, be an exemplary male figure, but yes. not, you know, just a, a, on one hand, uh, you can't even mention five others that have done the same. Yeah, uh, ju just to add also on what my colleague here was saying, mm. many men are, are starting to come out, and believe it or not, they are starting to come out, especially with us, as it, not in my name, South Africa. Uh, um, we've, we are having those men as part of our programs. Uh, they come out and say, uh, you know what, this is what I've been doing, but I want to change. And what we do is we, 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 we take them and then they become part of the movement. And of course, that is what also, also Ubra Petriksha is doing with Kulumandot and other programs. So what is important is that these people, let's not discard them. As soon as they, in our case, even we don't wait until they go to prison. We are dealing with them now while they're still abusing their wives. All right. Okay, reason. let's take Dr. Omar, who's back with us. Uh, and thanks so much for your patience. Uh, just to pick up on your train of thought around the gaps uh, that need to be attended to. Okay, so the gaps that we looked, looked at and what we are experiencing is that victims are afraid to come forward simply due to the fact that the law enforcement agencies are failing them. When they report a case, they always it's almost as if they are accused of what has happened and there's blame shifted on the victim. And I think there's secondary victimization and traumatization at station level. And even if we go into the criminal justice system, going to the courts where there's a continuous delay, postponement, and the shabby treatment of victims where they are not even prepared or equipped to testify in court. So again, once again, they are being re-victimized and these are processes or gaps that are deterring victims from coming forward because often there's a lot of doubt and disbelief and victims are feeling more stigmatized and very vulnerable when they enter the criminal justice system. So, I mean, these are some of the gaps that we are faced with and you, we can see why many victims do not actually come forward and those that have made disclosures are afraid of what they may be subjected to through the process of facing uh, the perpetrator, facing the law. Mm. But, but Dr. Omar, has the uh, social media platform now become a proxy to the courts? If you'll take uh, Deputy Minister of Higher Education, Tutuzi Manala's case, uh, in, in the sense that, albeit that the system in itself may be fractured, but there are outlets. If you get it out, you'll get uh, public sympathy and a quicker response would be then meted against the perpetrator. Indeed, absolutely. I think social media has become more of a friend than a foe to victims of sexual abuse. And this has certainly facilitated the recognition, the suffering and the invisible trauma that many of these victims of sexual abuse have been subjected to. So social media 
has become a, 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 an excellent platform and a precursor to ensure that people's cases are, and opportunities, opportunities are given some uh, focus. Mm. All right, Dr. Shahida Omar, Teddy Bear Clinic, uh, Clinical Director, thank you so much for joining us via Skype. We'll wrap it up here in studio. In the uh, case uh, with the allegations around the Safa Bostani Jordan, if uh, Jennifer Ferguson doesn't lay the charges, you can't then make a citizen's arrest or interfere in that process. What then is, is the support that victims can rely on in a, in a case where, especially where um, action is not taken? Uh, what, we, what we need to do is to embrace the victim. Um, make them, like, you know, the um, uh, doctor was saying, make them, you know, deal with the trauma. Uh, because some of them, it's not, like she have said, you know, she wanted the, the perpetrator, the alleged perpetrator, to come forward and apologize for what had happened. So in that manner, if we embrace her and we believe in what she's saying and saying that we believe in you and then maybe open that avenue for her to open a, a formal case, that could be something else. Because at times people are afraid to, what would be the recapitulations of me opening the case? This is a very big person. And then because if also she doesn't open the case against um, the, uh, Dr. Jordan, then there could be reputational damage on his side. Because this also has got, we have to look at it in both ways because now it's still allegation. However, we need to ensure that the environment is very conducive for anyone who might have been um, uh, alleged, um, uh, perpetrated years ago. We have got Sexual Offences Act that has been amended and p lots of people can come forward and uh, lay, lay the charges against those that arrest them. So we need to be ma make sure that, you know, mindful of the fact that there are people involved. We have to be sensitive how we handle it going forward in everything that comes before or yesteryear that, you know, create that enabling environment. And we're there as a Commission for Gender Equality to embrace and engage them. Mm. It has a turn, it's been a turning point, hashtag me too, if you take uh, Harvey Weinstein um, and the women that have come forward. But it had to take, again, a Hollywood approach to dealing with matters domestically that uh, are perennial. So, hashtag not in my name, what kind of impact has that had uh, in, in relation to the hashtag me too comparison, if you want? Mm. No, these are honestly, Cindy, two different uh, hashtags in a sense that Not In My Name was actually a response um, to supplement the, the, the fight against gender-based violence from a men's perspective. However, I'd like to say that uh, we appreciate the work that is done by the hashtag MeToo um, and also to embrace social media for the good work that it is, the platform that it, it, is, it is actually provided. But just to mention this and to say that Not In My Name South Africa has developed a program that is called Case Closed that will be going back as far as 20, 20 years ago. Uh, we will be working with uh, the South African Police Services, uh, Mr. Minister Figil Mbalula and his office, whereby we will revis revisiting all, all these cases and to say that it is important that we believe these women uh, regardless of because it takes courage to finally speak up and talk about uh, your rape ordeal and things like that. So that is what we are doing from our side and we are, uh, we are calling on every woman, uh, those that have been um, uh, abused and raped and, 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 and to yeah. come do, forward. Do you believe that this is a turning point in the scourge against uh, uh, violence or gender-based violence? It is a turning point. You know, everywhere where we go, everyone says me too. Uh, where we go, not in my name. Where we go, they talk. They, what, one thing which the people ask, they will ask you, what's your Twitter handle? What's, what's your Facebook uh, handle? So that they can write to you and tag you in things like of this nature to say, the Gender Commission, we know you have been working in this, in this field. Here is my story. Can we talk to you? They're phoning our offices. Our, lawyer, our lawyers you know, are, are in, indebted with, with lots of phone calls coming from society saying that, you know, we want to work with you, the Commission for Gender Equality, in all the nine provinces. And that is, that is a joy to us that more people are coming because of the visibility of the Commission for Gender Equality and other entities that we work with. We have been with them in Cape Town, with women ministers, and other, as a commission, that's why when people saying we're working in silos now. I, I wonder because that's no longer the case. People, we are embracing one another in the gender sector and then we understand one another's shortcomings. All right, Mr. Baloyi, we're going to have to leave it there. Javu Baloyi, Commission for Gender Equality spokesperson. And we had uh, Dr. Shahida Omar, Teddy Bay Clinic, Clinical uh, Director, and Siabulela Gentile, activist and uh, CEO and founder of Hashtag Not In My Name SA. We take a quick break. Do you stay with us.